हेलो एंड वेलकम सो टुडे वी आर स्टार्टिंग ए वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट अ न्यू डेजिग्नेशन ऑफर्ड बाय द इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंटरनल ऑडिटर्स व्हिच इज द इंटरनल ऑडिट प्रैक्टिशनर सो थैंक्स टू इन द इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंटरनल ऑडिटर्स दैट दे हैव ऑफर्ड दिस डेजिग्नेशन द इंटरनल ऑडिट प्रैक्टिशनर्स टू द अर्ली कैरियर प्रोफेशनल्स एंड द यूनिवर्सिटी स्टूडेंट्स so they can set a foundation on the internal audit understanding on the strong footings so as per iia the internal audit practitioner designation is a great way to demonstrate internal audit aptitude active internal audit practitioners opens a new pathway to the certified internal auditor designation the only globally recognized certification as we all know for the internal audit practitioners around the world also thanks to sojip who has identified that there is a gap and lack of material available on internal audit practitioner so i'm trying to make a series of videos which will help the students like sojip who can get get help from my videos and hopefully can uh, get over the line be over the hump on the basis of my videos and the guidance i have given my email address as well so if you want to get more guidance and more uh, coaching on that you can connect with me as well so let's get off to a start so let's quickly review the outline of the iap the candidates will have 2 years to complete the internal audit practitioner program from the date approved into the program uh, you may showcase uh, this designation on your cv uh, or resume for 3 years uh, validity no cp is required the designation is non renewable for 3 after 3 years there are 3 years to avail uh, the cia and also five syllabus domain is there five domains are there each dealing with a set of ia standards which i'll explain later on two hours examination there uh, 100 mcqs and 100 self study practice questions included with the approved application so now let's see the iap syllabus uh, which is having five domains and 23 objectives So first is internal audit attributes, which is covering standard 1000, 1100, and 1200, and having five objectives. Uh, this uh, becomes 20% uh, of the overall uh, syllabus coverage. Uh, the second is again 20% coverage, nature of work, uh, which is uh, covering uh, by the standards 2100 with the four objectives. uh then 23% engagement planning standard 2200 having the five objectives uh then engagement work standard 2300 25% of the scope uh, of the syllabus coverage uh, having the six objectives and the last one is engagement communication standard 2400 having three objectives and 12% of the scope coverage so as i said earlier in this video we will be covering domain 1 uh, which is covering the 20% of the syllabus and basically covering the internal audit attribute related standards uh, there are five objectives in this domain which are uh, number 1 recognize the elements of the ias international professional practices framework uh, the relevant standard is given in front of it to explain the difference between assurance and consulting services provided by the internal audit activity define internal audit activity independence and an individual internal auditor's objectivity including determining whether an individual internal auditor has any impairments to his or her objectivity <clears throat> number 4 is describe the knowledge and competencies that an internal auditor needs to possess to perform his or her individual responsibilities and number 5 is define due professional care and illustrate an individual internal auditor's competency through continuing professional development so first and foremost the most important thing is you need to go to my channel audit strategy which is having all the videos because all along the line i will be giving references to the videos uh, so you need to visit this channel the link is given here uh, you can search with the name of audit strategy and you can uh you can access my channel so for domain 1 first you refer to my videos on standard 1000 per purpose authority and responsibility and standard 1010 which is about recognizing the mandatory elements of the ippf 
So let's get uh, an understanding of the objectives and understand uh, what is the meaning of these objectives. So first is recognize the mandatory elements or recognize the elements of the IPPF, the International Professional Practices Framework. So standard 1000 and 1100, uh, 1010, which I've referred in uh, already, uh, you must have seen my videos. Uh, or maybe after this video, you can just go through those videos, make your notes and get a detailed understanding of the standard of the implementation guide and also uh, how to implement what are the implementation considerations and what are the conformance requirement from those standards so better to have a full review of my videos uh, right now or later on and i'll just give you an overview of the objectives which we are covering the iap so the, uh, to recognize the elements of the IP, uh, PPF, the internal audit charter must formally define the purpose, authority and responsibility of the internal audit activity consistent with the mission of internal auditing and the mandatory elements of the IPPF. So mission, uh, the definition is uh, lying there on the uh, website of IAEA. You can read that uh, for the mandatory elements of the IPPF. Uh, these are the core principles of the professional practice of internal auditing, uh, the code of ethics, uh, the standards, and the definition of internal auditing. So what is the difference between the assurance services and consulting services provided by the internal audit activity? So the assurance services are denoted as dot A uh, when those standards you will see, while the consulting services are denoted as dot C when they are, uh, you can see them in the standards. Uh, number two, the, the, the children's services involve the internal auditor's objective assessment of the evidence to provide opinions on the conclusions or the conclusions regarding an entity, operation, function, process, while for consulting services are in, the, in advisory in nature and are generally performed at the specific request of an engagement client. Uh, number three, the nature and scope of an assurance engagement is, are determined by the internal auditor. While for consulting services, the nature and scope of consulting engagement are subject to agreement with the engagement client. And number four, generally there are three parties for assurance services, which are the process owner, the internal auditor, and the user. Uh, for, for consulting services, there are two parties. One is the internal order, second is the engagement client. Now the second segment of domain one, uh, which is again part of the internal audit attributes, will be covered by the standard 1100. So you can refer to my videos um, I, uh, and, and uh, uh, also have an understanding of what is independent objectivity what is organizational independence and the direct interaction with the board. So all these three uh, uh, videos are available. I have given uh, the links to the, uh, those, you know, you know my channel. So you can just scroll down and find out these videos very easily. Uh, the title or the thumbnail is already given in, in my video so that you can easily uh, understand uh, which video you, you want to uh, watch. Uh, I'll get more details about these, uh, the, the objectives, uh, and but you need to build your understanding uh, by watching these videos and making your notes. And also refer to 1112, 1120 and 1130, which are covering the chief audit executive's roles behind, uh, beyond internal auditing, individual objectivity and impairment to independence. So now we'll come to third objective, which is part of this, out of the five objectives covering this domain. The third objective is to define the internal audit activity or independence and an individual internal auditor's objectivity, including determining whether an individual internal auditor has any impairments to his or her objectivity. So the internal audit activity must be independent as per the 1100 series the basic requirement I am just sharing with you. The internal auditors must be objective in performing their work. The chief audit executive must report to a level within the organization that allows the internal audit activity to fulfill its responsibility. Okay, so the reporting line is very important for the chief audit executive which gives a, uh, the, the chief audit executive independence. 
then the chief audit executive must confirm to the board at least annually the organizational independence of the internal audit activity. So internal chief audit executive has an important role uh, to confirm the organizational independence. Any hurdles, any obstacles, any scope limitations should be identified by the chief audit executive. And chief audit executive must communicate and interact directly with the board. Again, the direct interaction, if eliminated, will uh, reduce or will mitigate uh, the, maybe you can say that will impair the independence part for the internal auditors, for the chief audit executive and the, for the internal audit activity as a whole. So we have heard the word independence again and again. So what is independence? It is freedom from conditions. The, the independence is freedom from conditions that threaten the ability of the internal audit activity to carry out internal audit responsibilities in an unbiased manner. Degree of independence, that to achieve the degree of independence necessary to effectively carry out the responsibilities of internal audit activity. The chief audit executive has direct and unrestricted access to the senior management at the board. Now, the same thing, the reporting line we were discussing. And the dual reporting relationship. This can be achieved through a dual reporting relationship. Threats to independence must be managed at the individual auditor, engagement, functional and organizational level. So what is organizational independence? An interesting uh, topic. Uh, so you have to see the 1100 series interpretation for that. Uh, the organizational independence is effectively achieved when the chief audit executive reports functionally to the board. Examples of the functional reporting to the board involve the board approving the charter, the approving the risk-based internal audit plan, the board approving the internal audit budget and resource plan, receiving communications from chief audit executive on the internal audit activities performance rel relative to its plan and other matters, approving decisions regarding the appointment and removal of the chief audit executive, approving the remuneration of the chief audit executive, and making appropriate inquiries of the management and the chief audit executive to determine whether there are inappropriate scope or resource limitations. So all these gives an understanding of the functional reporting. For example, if you eliminate one, uh, which is uh, the internal audit budget or resource plan, so you're not having enough resources to deliver your plan. This can happen because management will not support you or management may not uh, may play in, in that area and they will not give you required skills uh, or will not cover your skill gap by providing required resources maybe outsourcing the relevant part or you you can hire those resources or those skills uh, but if management is not supporting in that which can happen very easily if only the resources and budget part is, is taken away from the board and given it to the management so you need to be uh, as a chief audit executive uh, be aware of the situations which will uh, bring independence at the organizational level to the internal audit activity. So what is objectivity? So objectivity is an unbiased mental attitude that allows internal auditors to perform engagements in such a manner that they believe in their work product and that no quality compromises are made. Objectivity requires that internal auditors do not subordinate their judgment on audit matters to others. So it is not about, uh, objective is about not setting up a perception before you are reviewing your work, but it is about trusting on your work product, so, uh, trusting on your uh, efforts to understand the scenario and the situation rather than having a perception about a process, about a function, about a segment which you are auditing. Uh, so it's more about eliminating those uh, perceptions and having a decision on the basis of factuals, uh, the identifications, the evidences which you are having and then decide uh, and make conclusions on, on that area. So you have to remove any objectivity. Your objectivity can be hampered by anyone like your friend, 
your colleague, someone you have trust on, and he can manipulate with your mind by saying a simple a couple of sentences. So you need to have uh, that uh, understanding of and fairness and unbiased mind that you eliminate all those uh, comments and only judge them on the basis of what is on the table, uh, what evidence is there and you review that and make your conclusions accordingly. So another part of third objective is that define internal order activity independence and individual internal order subjectivity including determining whether an individual internal order has any impairments to his or her objectivity. So where the chief order executive has or is expected to have roles and responsibilities that fall outside of internal auditing, safeguards must be placed to limit the impairments to independence or objectivity. So we'll, we'll discuss this uh, in the next slide uh, in more detail. Uh, so internal auditor must have an impartial, unbiased attitude and avoid any conflict of interest. How we will we'll see the definition of conflict of interest also in the next slides. If internal, if independence of, or objectivity is impaired in fact or appearance, the details of the impairment must be disclosed to the appropriate parties. The nature of the disclosure will depend upon the impairment. So relevant parties or appropriate parties are, depends upon the impact of that. Uh, uh, ultimately, these are the board of directors or audit committee, which you are reporting to and the top management. So what was the chief audit executive's role beyond the internal auditing? So chief audit executive may be asked to take an additional role, uh, take on additional roles or responsibilities outside of internal auditing like uh, the responsibility of compliance or risk management, uh, maybe taxation. <clears throat> These roles and responsibilities may impair the organizational independence, independence of the internal audit activity or the individual objectivity of the internal auditor. So what we have to do, we have to, may, you, we have to have safeguards, we have to have the safeguards uh, for those oversight activities which, has, or which are often undertaken by the board. Uh, so these, these of, of oversight activities are to address these potential impairments and may include like uh, the board wants to have a periodical evaluation uh, uh, on the reporting lines. So they can understand any impairment of that. Board can uh, have an exercise of developing alternative processes to obtain assurance related to the areas of additional responsibility. For example, if audit is looking after, uh, or the chief audit is looking, looking after the compliance function, so they, uh, the board can outsource the assurance role rather than they will ask from the internal audit team to do an internal audit of compliance function, which is already under their domain they will ask an outside party to come and give an independence assurance on the compliance function. So what is conflict of interest? So conflict of interest uh, or COI is a situation in which an internal auditor who is in a, in, a, in a position of trust has a competing professional or personal interest. So you do have developed some personal or professional interest which may affect your decision. So what is what competing interest does? <clears throat> Such competing interest can make it difficult to fulfill his or her duties impartially. So a COI exists even if no unethical or improper act results. So you have you need to understand that it is not something you can always classify as unethical or improper or illegal. You uh, this is something uh, which is having impact on your decision actually. Then what is the impact? Uh, achieve, uh, a, con a conflict of interest can create an appearance of impropriety that can undermine confidence in internal auditor, the internal audit activity and the profession. So the, chief, and the, so the COI can, could impair an individual's ability to perform his or her duties and responsibilities objectively. Uh, refer to uh, series 1200 now uh, there are three videos for that 1200 is for uh, profession proficiency and do do care and they, they are explained in 1210 proficiency and 1220 is due professional care and 1230 is about cpd 
So the fourth objective of domain one is describe the knowledge and competencies that an internal auditor needs to possess to perform his or her individual responsibilities. So as per the basic requirement of uh, the series 1200, uh, the engagement must be performed with proficiency and due professional care. So profici proficiency is that an internal auditor must possess the knowledge, skills and other competencies needed to perform their individual responsibilities. The internal auditor activity collectively must possess or obtain the knowledge, skills and other competencies needed to perform its responsibilities. Due professional care, internal auditors must apply the care and skill expected of a reasonably prudent and competent internal auditor, due professional care does not imply infallibility. This means that uh, you don't have to be perfect. It does not mean that you have to be perfect in uh, doing something, but the main point is the reasonable assurance is there. So there's nothing absolute or perfection expected from the internal auditor. So that is why it says that due profession does care does not due professional care does not imply in fallibility. So let's understand proficiency in more detail. Uh, it's a collective term that refers to the knowledge, skills and other competencies required of internal auditors to effectively carry out their professional responsibilities. It encompasses a consideration of current activities, trends and emerging issues to enable relevant advice and recommendations. So that means that internal auditor is aware of the current trends, activities, the issues, know the market, your industry. So not only the internal audit profession, but the sector or industry you're working. The internal auditors are encouraged to demonstrate their proficiency by obtaining appropriate professional certifications and qualifications such as the Certified Internal Auditor designation or other designations offered by the Institute of Internal Auditors or other appropriate professional organizations. And the fifth objective of the domain is the due professional care and illustrate an individual internal auditor's competency through continuing professional development. So the basic requirement of series of, of, of 1230 a standard series is that interpreters must enhance their knowledge, skills and other competencies through continuing professional development. Thank you so much everyone. Uh, the, the hope you will like uh, this first video on internal audit practitioner subject. Uh, if you want to get an online guidance or coaching as an individual or as a group, you can always contact me. I am giving my email address. Uh, drop me an email address, give a subject tagline of internal audit practitioner to that and then you will uh, get response in due course of time and uh, also keep watching my videos, share this as well so that uh, the students similar to you will get help uh, and will get some guidance on the subject and we can pass their exams easily uh, by saving their time on the subject and rather than reading through all those standards, my videos might save time and they can also directly approach me for further guidance. So thanks and take care.